All right, here we go. Dr. Kevin Jefferson here, chair of the podiatric medicine and surgery section of the podiatry section of the National Medical Association, here with my very special guest, Dr. Lawrence Harkless. You know him, you love him, the man, the myth, the legend. He does not need a great introduction. Most of us already know who he is and what he does and what he's done and what he's meant to the profession of podiatry. But personally, I have to say he's been a great friend. He's been a great mentor. I've known him since the uh, early 90s when I was a student at NYCPM, listening to his lectures there at the school, listening to him lecture at different places around the country. He is basically the dean of podiatric medicine and surgery here in the United States and probably even across the world. He's lectured uh, all across the world. I know people who've trained under him. Uh, we all in one way have trained under him if you've been to uh, any of his lectures. And everything he says uh, sticks with you. And again, it's not just a great teacher. He's not just a great physician, but he is a friend of mine. He's a friend of a, a lot of us. And uh, I, I'm very blessed that, that, you, that you're here, Doc. I appreciate you being here, man. All right. But let, let, me, let me let everybody know how this, how this came to be. All right. So my wife and I, uh, last night, just before midnight, we flew in from our vacation in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. And I get a text from Dr. Harkless talking about uh, Jefferson, call me. I'm like, well, what's be important? You know, it's close to midnight. What's, what's Doc need right now? And so, so I call him and say, yo, Jeff, I'm in town. Let's get together for lunch. I'm like, all right, cool. Uh, what time do you want me to call you back? He said, just call me in the morning. We'll, hook, we'll, we'll set it up. And so we just came from lunch. We went to Ben's Chili Bowl here in D.C. And uh, I'm going to let, let him tell you uh, why he's in D.C. Doc, say hello to people. Say what's up, man. Yeah, thanks, uh, Kevin. It's good to, uh, to be here and to, to be, be in your midst. Uh, I'm in uh, D.C. My daughter lives here in D.C., and uh, we have two grandkids here. She's in on, on Constitution Avenue, about 10 blocks from the, uh, from the Capitol. And uh, we were here to uh, babysit our, uh, the two grandkids for a couple of days. And we were previously, uh, the previous week, we were in Richmond with my son and his three grandkids as uh, one turned one year old, and then the nine year old had a big piano recital. So I'm being grandpa, grandfather, uh, take, I guess sharing wisdom with the grandkids. That's, I guess that's what it's about. And my wife says that uh, I just really need to be retired and be engaged with the grandkids at the same level that. We were engaged with our kids, uh, et cetera. And I really think that that's important uh, because of, uh, if uh, we are spiritual, uh, the good book says uh, be fruitful and, uh, and reproduce. And uh, wisdom comes from being, having fear of, uh, fear of the Lord, really, and, and the spirituality of who we are and whose we are and why we are and, and how we really came about. And so, uh, so it's always uh, good to, to visit with students. My wife thinks that I, still don't want to run everything and talk to everybody and tell them what to do. But I tell her that I'm not trying to tell anybody what to do. I just I want to share our, uh, just insights, perspective, and, and, uh, and stay engaged with the uh, students and, and, uh, and practitioners uh, that have spent time with me or may have, have learned from me. Uh, because I would still believe that a teacher uh, touches eternity, really, when you teach, and it's really, really from the heart. And I think that's important for everyone in their lives to figure out what their purpose is, God's purpose and his plan for us, and if, it's, if that's indeed true in terms of our gift, then he will bless you in that gift. And probably uh, he, uh, Kevin had asked me that, but I feel like that's probably the most significant thing I can say, yes, to say today is to make sure you find your gift and you go and wrap it, and then you got to share your gift with everyone and then seek the wisdom from people uh, that have the uh, the gray hair and some experiences in terms of things that you're trying to uh, accomplish. And God will bless you and he'll give you the uh, the desires of your heart. And it's unlimitless, uh, unlimitedly. I mean, we can go, grow and become unlimitedly in terms of what we can be, uh, et cetera. So I think it's important to be uh, being and what that, what that really is. Mm -hmm. I'm going to hush, Kevin. <laughs> We're probably talking too much. You can also say give a picture a microphone, right? <laughs> I, I'm not a Dane, but I am spiritual, and I definitely yeah. believe uh, in that. I'll call it the five or seven Ps that he said he, uh, what, what have he said in the Word in terms of the promises he's given us? He said he would provide, and that's true because everything that we do comes from the ground. And uh, he said that he would uh, guide and protect us in any situation. So he's our safety, security, 
the salvation, everything that we need is just through the through the word and and honoring that and everything that we do. And so I call it the the tree of life versus the tree of good and evil. So if you about the tree of life, uh, everything is good. Yes, sir. <laughs> you know, you've been one of the pillars of our profession. I, I, I must say that. Again, you've been a friend and mentor of me since even before I graduated school. I remember when I was a student in New York, I'm this, I'm this raw kid coming in from Dallas, didn't know anybody, you know, and you're there. And then you come in and you give uh, a presentation to uh, the SNAPMA members. Okay. And then at, at the time, there must have been about 15 or 20 of us at the, at the NY school uh, at that time. And I can't remember everything you said, but the, uh, what, what you told us about being present and, and always being knowledgeable and always learning because you will never figure everything out. You will never know everything there is about what you've chosen to do as a profession. So always learn, always be in a posture of learning and not learning just from your books, but also learning from each other. And that most of all, you'll learn mostly from your patients. Right. Right. Because what, what I've understood from you was that the degree will give you the letters after your name, yeah. but your patience will make you a doctor. Right. That's true. Well, that's true, Kevin. Right. Well, the fact, well, I mean, the, 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 well, it's all about, as you shared, uh, learning and the people that like to learn, I would say, all the uh, leaders at whatever they do, uh, because uh, there are things in medicine that we still can't explain. And if you look at the spiritual side, you know, he would, you call that a miracle. <laughs> and so uh, being in diabetic foot wound healing, I've seen things that have healed that I didn't think would heal. And I've seen just the opposite. But uh, I'm, I was always kind of a why person when something happened. And I believe there's a reason for everything. If we keep asking the questions and keep searching and and keep uh, keep looking, and um, I, I trained in surgery on the Lou Pack uh, in uh, Atlanta. He was the program director. But he trained on the Marvin Steinberg, who was the father of podiatric medicine out of New York. And Steinberg, um, uh, I went to Atlanta to learn surgery, but Lou Pack refined my thought process and he taught me how to observe, how to see. Mm -hmm. And and he was constantly making sure that you didn't miss anything uh, in your exam, and that you were consistent in your in, in your exam. And then we had to go to his house every Wednesday night for a conference uh, when I was in Atlanta for the year of surgery. And the other two residents, they one trained at Kern in Detroit, which is where the the uh, genesis of surgery was, with Earl Kaplan, Weinstock, and Earl Cannon, those guys. And the other one trained at North Lake in Chicago, and Maloa Wild, or Wild Osteotomy, was the program director in the Wild, Smith and Wild at the time. And during the decade of the 70s, they had the best uh, uh, best program. And um, so they had both performed about 800 procedures as first-year residents, and I hadn't performed any. Mm -hmm. But what I learned at the Health Science Center in San Antonio, uh, rotating on all the medical services, was um, you know the medicine part and how important that was and understanding how that was connected to the foot. And so I tried to share with them the, the year I was there, what I knew in medicine, but they really weren't interested. They were still just kind of interested in, in the surgical part. And by me having that opportunity to train uh, in San Antonio, uh, I, I love Lou Pack. Uh, I, I was excited to go to his house every Wednesday night and they hated it, but I would never be as sharp as Lou Pack. <laughs> but but I like to I like a good fight, so I like to spar with him. So uh, if we would uh, had a topic, I was going to read and prepare to the best of my ability, given my limited experience, uh, you know, about whatever we were going to discuss. And so if I could do that, then I could probably spar with him just a little bit. And so I was just excited about it because I knew that going there, I was going to leave there learning a lot more than I knew, mm -hmm. and how to go about how to learn also was important. Yeah. So so. Uh, uh, and all my family were school teachers, and so between my uh, my sisters and brothers and even my, my father, um, it, you know, it was really about learning. And my father told me all the tomatoes don't ripen on the vine at the same time. And so that's how learning is. So you can't 
put all the students in the same basket. You got to meet each student where they are, give them time to grow and that. And I kind of learned that on the farm also because my father always used the agronomy, a farm analogy in all of his teaching and my mm -hmm. grandparents too because everything was all about, about the farm. And so as I kind of matured and studying the Bible and the Word, uh, I was doing Bible study fellowship at a national and I was reading in the fourth, uh, the sixth chapter of Galatians. And then as I read that, I realized that that was what Big Mama and Daddy and them were saying, but it was all paraphrased. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so the light kind of goes on at different times for each student, uh, all of us in, in individually. And so we just have to have an open mind and have that desire to uh, want to know and want to want to know why and keep searching and looking. And and the, and the Spirit of God in us will lead us where we need to go, and you will continue to learn uh, uh, all your life. And and uh, th those are the people that I think are probably the happiest. That uh, when you say uh, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, you know, you if you're spiritual and you uh, have a purpose and you follow that purpose and the plan, you know, then life is good. We don't all have uh, I call it situation, circumstance, predicaments in our lives, uh, but. Um, uh, those are lessons that uh, we have been taught. If there's a, something going on, there's a, some lesson that uh, uh, God is trying to teach us in, what, in whatever we're doing. And so we just have to be uh, steadfast in whatever we're doing. And then uh, we'll learn that lesson. And then the key about that is then did, did you share that with others, not only your family, but just throughout your walk of life. And so to me, the ministry of medicine is, the, is, is probably the, is bigger than the preacher because uh, people trust you, uh, trust you, and and it's pretty much ultimate trust in there until you do something anyway. If you're not honest and tell them what happened and why and all of that, but uh, there's no more noble of a profession than than practicing medicine every day. And as you know, uh, Mary washed Jesus' feet, so it's uh, humble thing to be the foot doctor. Yes, sir. And it's so much respect that we have from our patients. And and I'll say that I underestimated the impact that I had in the community until I left private practice in 93 to go full-time to the university. And I never forgot there was an older gentleman named Mr. Amos. He was probably about in the mid-80s at the time. But I used to see him every six weeks for about 16 years because that's how long I was in private practice, so two days a week. And he kind of he took my arm and grabbed me and said, Dr. Harkless, you can't, you can't leave me. Do you realize that I've been seeing you for 16 years? And, and I mean, it was like he wasn't going to let me go. Mm. And, uh, I mean, I just kind of cried. You know, so, I mean, I knew I had an impact on the patients and, and loved them and they loved me because in so many ways they demonstrated that. But uh, the impact of that was just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And not only him, a whole lot of more felt mm -hmm. <laughs> the same way because there's a relationship because he looked forward to talking to me every six weeks. And, and I mean, I took care of his feet, whatever was wrong medically, but we talked about a whole lot of different things, mm -hmm. et cetera. So, so we learn from one another, and I think that the more we share, and that's the service part of what we do. Uh, the good book says, what is your ministry? And ministry is service. And so we have to have a ministry uh, in what we're doing as the, the doctor or whatever our profession is in terms of helping others. Mm -hmm. I think that's the, that's the serving part that's so important. So what's interesting to me, one of the things that's interesting to me about your story was how a young black kid from Jim Crow, East Texas, gets to where you are now through schooling, uh, work, private practice, into academia. So how does a, a young black kid from Jim Crow, East Texas, get into academic medicine? Well, I, I think that started from Mayflower Elementary and High School in Tatum. Mm -hmm. uh, which was a black school. And the history of all of that is, is, is really significant from the perspective that there were seven communities that had a school in the church that consolidated in 1947. And in 55, uh, they had a bond issue. And at that time, uh, it was a poll tax. But uh, we had a guy, the minister of our church, Ms. Smith Chapel Missionary Baptist Church in the Mayflower community, uh, J.C. Beckworth became the principal. But he was the guy that organized all those communities to consolidate. And so that took a, a lot of skill, if you can imagine, mm -hmm. in terms of back in, back in those days. Uh, so they actually passed a bond issue, and they built a brand-new school. Now, about prior to that, Rosenwald, who was the CEO of Seals and Roebuck, uh, built what they call Rosenwald School in the South, in the rural communities. 
and he had an architect to develop a plan, and then they would put that in those communities where they needed a school. And so we, I think there were three or four Rosenwald schools within those seven. And one of them was uh, Mayflower School there right uh, next to where the church where I grew up in my grandmother's house. Mm. Yeah. So so uh, by that consolidation, uh, the black school was uh, was amazing in terms of uh, the um, teaching the, the entire child, you know, civics, just everything. And they told us we were someone every day, somebody every day that uh, you could, could compete. And so uh, uh, through segregation, we had the Preview and Scholastic League. So I was uh, like, I think I came in second place in Class A in spelling. Uh, by us being on the farm, they had the agriculture car because it was A and M and N. So we would go down with the um, our agriculture teacher, Mr. Arville Lewis, and uh, we would do land judging and tree judging and just all of that. And so uh, we were taught to compete, and we could, we could compete with anybody. And so uh, the spirituality part was solid there as as, as well. And so what I when I when I look back on that, Kevin, I would look at that. The foundation for all that was really for Mayflower because uh, I played sports. I was a quarterback, and uh, recently I was inducted into the Preview Interscholastic League Hall of Fame. But what I realized was that on the farm, I learned that there was a time to plant, grow, harvest. You can't get out of cycle and what that meant. And then in the sports, I learned how to win and lose. Mm. Yeah. So, And then I learned the importance of team uh, playing sports. I felt like we were going to score a touchdown on every play. Now, we didn't score a touchdown on every play, but we were going to score four or five every game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if everybody's doing what they're supposed to do. Yes, sir. And then, uh, and, then I, and then you trust the players. You know, it was tr- – you know, so you learn a lot of skills and things and, and and how to overcome adversity, all of that. That was all part of, of just growing up and being black and what we had to overcome in that whole process. Mm-hmm. The other issue was that the, the day that we passed that bond issue to build a new school, that night, two white guys went down the road shooting in people's houses. They shot at my grandmother's house. She was on her knees praying. Wow. And they hit one of those posts and shook shade off. Didn't hit her. Mm-hmm. Two more miles down the road, Mr. Bubba Tonson was a deacon in the church. And they shot in the bus in his house. Didn't hit anybody. And that uh, former row 782 uh, deads in into State Highway 149. And that's the highway between uh, Tatum and Longview. And it's about, I think it's about 18 miles from, from Tatum itself to there. But it's it was about about 13 miles, I guess, from where Mr. Bubba was. Mm-hmm. And about halfway up there was a black uh, barbecue place called Grady Green's Barbecue. And um, that was a, like a disco today, uh, you know, jukebox, barbecue, people would dance mm-hmm. and just have a good time. And a guy named John Earl Reese was in that dance with Faye Nelson, and they shot in there and killed John Earl. He's the mm-hmm. only African-American on the Civil Rights Museum in Montgomery. Mm-hmm. He's from Tatum, Texas. Yeah. And so my grandmother was in the uh, Dallas Morning News and the Houston Chronicle. And so uh, they didn't do, it, do anything to those two guys. Wow. Yeah. But uh, uh, Kaylee, I forgot her last name, uh, was a law student at Northwestern in Boston, Northeastern in Boston. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were had an innocence project. And so they would take on those cases in the South that never got solved. And so she took on John L. Reese's case. Okay. And by that time, my brother became the principal of the high school in Tatum. So he had access to a lot of the, the school records and all of that. So uh, they end up creating a General Reach Road. They have a, a memorial there right at the church and the school and, you know, all that stuff now, mm-hmm. et cetera. So, so there was a lot of history in, in, uh, in Mayflower and all of that. But I believe that uh, the foundation that, that I needed to be successful, uh, uh, those uh, seeds were planted in, 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 in at, at that black school for 11 years. So I was in the first class when they integrated the high school in Tatum High in mm-hmm. the fall of 67. And uh, we had enough students to probably be 2A, but we ended up in playing in class B. Mm-hmm. And the fact that we had gone to the state championship in the black league, we had about 15 guys returning. And so we won, we beat everybody. And we won the state, the B, the, it was regional stuff in B at the time, but we played Bruceville Eddy, which is like sl- slightly south of Waco there mm-hmm. in Midway Stadium in Waco that year, and, and we won the championship of that. So, um, uh, so, so I just think that that had a lot to do with my uh, ability to learn, serve, lead, basically, mm-hmm. and, and and all of that, and that we could be leaders and et cetera. 
And uh, that's all, that's who we saw and who we knew, and we knew that we could become anything that we wanted to be. Yeah. Because um, uh, Professor Begwer says, he would say, uh, 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 I tell you that Larry Harkless is the best speller in the United States of America. Well, they told us all that every day and what we were doing, student council, all the different things. We would get to go to Dallas with Madison and Wheatley, you know, the big schools, mm -hmm. state student council, all that. So we were, we were representing everything that we were doing in that regard, preparing us to to integrate into that majority society, although at that point things were segregated, looking for a, a new day. Now, my father never talked about uh, integration or anything. He was um, uh, an educator, and in fact, that education was the uh, was the uh, was the key. And so, um, but his entrepreneurship was a farm. I didn't really know that, but Dad, you know, always had twenty, thirty cows. Mm -hmm. uh, he used to sell suits. He sell suits to the to the Anglo people and everybody. Mm -hmm. And if he sold uh, five or six suits, he'd get one free. So Dad always looked like he was worth a million dollars, like he came out of GQ or something. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I didn't know that then. You know what I mean? But uh, he used to talk about worthy use of leisure time. What are you doing with the eight that you ain't giving the man? Mm -hmm. And can you find a, a a skill, a trade that you can excel at, that that you can uh, can can make a little change at to to to, to improve yourself? Mm -hmm. And uh, and the worthy use of leisure time. I'm not so sure people know what that is. And maybe that's a uh, you know the the TikTok and you know the social media, right. the different things that we have today. But but we have to be diligent in knowing what our gift is. And how to unwrap that gift and, and service and and you know and getting you know remunerated you know paid to do some of the things that we're that we love to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, well, you know your legacy in your teaching prowess, you know, is unrivaled. Right, right. I mean, you 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 start you you've been you started two podiatry schools, one in California, one in past couple of years ago, two years ago in Texas, mm -hmm. you've trained a lot of very well-known podiatrists yep. mm -hmm. and other doctors in this country, uh, people I know, mm -hmm. people who've trained me, people who are doing great things in this field. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I, I've always looked up to you and many of us have looked up to you and try to model ourselves after you, and you not only being a, a great clinician, but also uh, a great teacher. So over lunch today, we talked about how more of us need to get into academic medicine. You know, how how should we go about doing that? Well, I think it's about, well, I think that's the most important thing that we need to do as podiatry is probably meet all the deans of every medical school in America, DO and MD, and uh, tell them you want to come and, and teach. And I think that you should start off in anatomy. Anatomy mm -hmm. is the foundation for everything in medicine. Work. Yeah, mm -hmm. everything. So, and the foot is the integral part of, mobility. So if you can go and just do a clinical correlation on anatomy at the medical school, that's a, that's how I started in San Antonio. Okay. It was a, nobody came to the lecture. And so once I started giving the lecture, they heard about it and they started coming. And, and, and then that's how I educated 200 medical students every year about what our profession was. Mm. And I, the first uh, two, three, four minutes, I'd say, how many of you know what a podiatrist is? Raise your hand. How many of you all know how long we go to school? Raise your hand. And it didn't really hands go up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was all about education. And and so um, uh, uh, doing that, I think, will allow us to integrate. And then there are other things we can teach as well. And so although I was in San Antonio and I did that for PT, um, uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy, um, nursing, all the allied health, so I was doing teaching basic science, anatomy, and anything else that they needed to know about the foot and ankle that they had in their curriculum. Mm -hmm. And even the PAs. Matter of fact, when I went to Western, PAs were the only school that I we weren't teaching the, the students because we do pharmacy and all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Matter of fact, uh, I did pharmacy. They didn't have a pharmacy school at UT San Antonio. It was at UT Austin. But about a third of the class came down there for rotations. Okay. So I started, uh, by being in family medicine, they were in family medicine, talking about the drugs, but they wanted the thing on over-the-counter problems for foot problems. Well, I didn't know nothing about over-the-counter thing for foot problems, but I went to the pharmacy and got everything they had in the thing on the foot. Mm. And then I and I didn't give a lecture on that. I told them about what the problem was and what they was trying to treat and how it needed to be sent to the podiatrist. Mm. That was early in my career. Mm. But one of the form Ds that was a professor asked me to do family medicine. He was in the family medicine department to teach the family medicine residents about all the drugs okay. as an expert. And UC San Francisco, I went to school, they pioneered a pharmacist being on every every service. 
that this was in the early seventies. Okay. Yeah, they were they were way ahead of their time as it relate as it as it related to that. So I kind of I guess I understood the importance of the interprofessional education, and and uh, I didn't realize it, but uh, podiatry was a division in the Department of Family Medicine from nineteen seventy two to eighty six in San Antonio. So uh, when I was there as an intern, but I came back on the faculty in seventy seven, and they could not admit a patient to the county hospital. Internal medicine wouldn't let them, and they had an MD degree. Hmm. So I thought that they were only prejudiced against podiatry hmm. as it related to that. But they were like the stepchild of medicine, being a family physician. Right. Yeah. Right. And I was, and I was the most vocal guy in the department, and I wasn't even an MD. I said, I can't believe y'all let them do that to y'all. <laughs> yeah. And so when the neck, the chairman left in '82, he became the dean of the medical school at East Tennessee State University of New School of Medicine. And then we got a guy from uh, UC Irvine, uh, Leonard Powell, as the new chair. Well, he was supposed to negotiate a award inpatient service for family medicine. Oh, and he, he didn't get it in writing, and they still didn't get it. Mm. And I thought they were going to tar and feather him in a faculty meeting one day. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm still, I'm just, a, you know, I call it the lowly podiatrist, but I was just the podiatrist there. But I earned their respect in terms of that. But I learned a lot there from them. Uh, family medicine was required to do, let's see, uh, a month, two months of um, of orthopedics, mm -hmm. and they all spent a, a month with me elected. Yeah, and they were they were my biggest uh, uh, supporter of who we were and that we were better than them on the foot and ankle. I didn't even have to tell. I mean, they got to work with both of us to see to see all of that. Go back to your question again. Let me get back. Well, it's about. What we particularly put our of color. Oh yeah, yeah. The, 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 about getting into academic, academic so, medicine. Yeah. Okay. So let me. That's why I want to get to get back. Yeah. Out, getting out on a tangent there. <laughs> the. Um, so I think everybody can has something to teach, and uh, if you, uh, as a resident, if you were teaching as a resident, if you had to give a lecture, well, that means that you have the you can teach. Uh, you have something to teach. And so that's something that I can help you with if you're interested. I'll take time to listen and, and you know, I still have a lot of slides. I need to convert them into uh, digitally and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But um, I would say that um, you may want to get a, a, a teaching certificate uh, or get a master's in education, or you may want to get a master's in public health, or you may want to get a master's in clinical investigation. What I would say to to the next, to the youngest group is to be sure that you can read the literature critically. That's the most important part, because if you can't, then you're at the mercy of going to a meeting and someone else interpreting it for you. So my point being is that you need to know the stats and, 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 and understand that, the uh, evidence-based uh, medicine drone clubs, if you will, where you have an expert there that can teach and mentor you, just like I can teach and mentor you about clinical stuff on the foot and ankle. Mm -hmm. You know, that type of thing. So when you're in your residency, if you're in a major teaching hospital where there are other residents or internal medicine, family medicine, find out what they're doing in terms of being able to read the literature critically from an evidence-based perspective and participate at the highest level as if you're getting a degree mm -hmm. where you read, there's some, some questions you have to answer, maybe there's a test, you know, to see can you do that. And the reason for that is that if you're good at it, then you can teach the residents how to do that as a teacher. Are you bringing some added value, you know, to the table as relate to what you're bringing from the foot and ankle, and from an evidence-based research perspective from the foot and ankle? And twenty percent of what a primary care physician sees uh, is on the foot and ankle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I've had many residents come back and tell us that years later. Yeah. Said, so go. You need to rotate on podiatry. Take it seriously. One to twenty-five percent of what you see in your practice is going to be foot and ankle, and you need to listen to Doctor Harkless. Yes, sir. And the other part is that the, my, my colleagues thought that I shouldn't be training the family physicians how to do all that because they're going to take the ingrown toenail and go hurt my practice. Yeah, people still say that today. Why are you talking about ingrown toenails to primary doctors? No, that's, that's, that's asinine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't give... The, the, all of them would try to do that, and they do it once or twice and don't get a good result, and they never try it again mm -hmm. <laughs> because that's not what they're there to do. Right. Now, some of them may have hand, eye, and skill coordinated, and they may get it right, and they may be good at it, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. But but let him do that. But he, if you train them well, you didn't just train them on an ingrown toenail. You taught them everything you knew about the foot and ankle. And if you did that well, if twenty some percent come in there, he ain't gonna, He may be seeing one or two percent of it. 
You're going to send another 18 to you and somebody next door to you. Those things will never stop. People are going to get diabetes. They're going to have some kidney disease. They're going to get this. They're going to get some neuropathy. It's the medicine part that we really need to know to integrate well. And so as a resident, if you do that and know that well, there's room for you in any medical school to teach and do stuff. And if you can read critically, that brings added value. And then the, the foot needs to be researched too. So anything you want to do research, you it's about collaboration and integration in that with the with the experts that know how to do all of that. But yeah. you have to humble yourself to realize how to do that. You know, and so I think that's the important part about academics is that uh, if you uh, like to teach and you like to learn, uh, that you'll stay relevant because in academics, uh, the medical schools will have case conference every week. Mm. And that's how they hold everybody accountable for that one word that we talked about earlier, which is learning. Right. Yeah, that's that's the key, key to that uh, process. So uh, to go back to how I became all that, it was uh, it was a lot of different things that, you know, I saw along the way. I didn't plan to be a dean and all of that, but just in the preparation and serving, I was able to to learn, to see, and to see how everything was connected. And and God doesn't give you the gift to be good at everything. That's why we all fail, mm -hmm. it, it, is that know what your gift is and stay in your lane, but get the other people on your team that allow you to be successful, that they probably wouldn't be successful if all you, you all wouldn't work together toward a common goal. And that goes back to playing football, mm -hmm. farming. Uh, I, I uh, We had a horse. We didn't have a tractor. And I did. I planted all the seeds. So my brother said, that's where you learn your discipline. You had to put that corn seed about 12 inches apart and you plant acres of it. Mm -hmm. wow. Then you had to get the weeds out of it. My grandmother planted peanuts and sweet potatoes. I hated to do that because you had to put the seed in the ground, get your fingers all in that old bad dirt. Mm -hmm. you, know? you know, so so I think all that is part of, uh, uh, of the foundation and that seed. The question is, what type of fruit are you producing from from the seed? And that's us as well. Mm -hmm. What are we doing? Uh, uh, what kind of fruit are we producing uh, from who we are and, 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 and serving in God's kingdom? I think that's the key. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. And so once you figure out that out, uh, it's like you doing your, we doing talking here now, mm -hmm. and what this is doing and hopefully people will learn from it, you know, in that, in that regard, it's the, it's the, it's the same thing. Yes, sir. It's about me, it's really about service and, and making it get better and the gift that we have and un unwrapping our gift. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the key. This setting right here, and sitting down here and eating lunch with you at Ben's today, and just the whole time I've known you over 30 years, and even in my practice. I mean, I remember when I was a student, when we were students in New York, you gave us your personal number. If you have any problem, pick up the phone, holler at me. You know, that no one else was doing that at that time. This is, is this pre-cell phone. Okay. This is pre-cell phone. Right, so back then, all you had was a home number. Okay. Nobody ever gave you their home number, right? But but you but you but you were doing doing that kind of stuff because you were invested in us as students. And now here I am, uh, thirty almost thirty years later. Not not only we just you know, teacher, mentor, colleague, and friends. Right. You know, uh, we have this this connection through Prairie View A and M. That's my alma mater. You have connection uh, through there to your your time spent. Uh, at, at Prairie View with football and things. Uh, my wife grew up down the street from where you grew up. She's from Longview. So y'all, you talked to my wife a few minutes ago before we started this uh, conversation. And y'all talked about this, the same people you know, yeah. preacher, the podiatrist, Dr. Willis, who got you started in the podiatry. Uh, he was my wife's grandmother's podiatrist. So there, there, there's no coincidence here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, you're right. right. You're right. So, I, so the, the the fact that we're able to have this conversation is as important to me and hopefully to a lot of folks that will be watching this as what we learn in a podiatry textbook. Absolutely. That's right. That's exactly right. right. Yeah. Is that we have to always be in a position to learn, not just from the books, not just from the uh, journal articles. Mm -hmm. But from each other, from our patients, from what we what we observe, just walking and driving down the street. Yeah. Well, I think the most important thing is that uh, yeah, that we all have self worth and we all have uh, a gift, and there's a reason to get to know the best of one another. And I think people, uh, you know, want to meet this person because he's a celebrity and all of that. But mm -hmm. but I, uh, 
you know, God has no respect of person, and you have to treat everybody with love and respect. And, you know, I, I was taught that at, you know, in Tatum and Mayflower, just uh, just growing up. And and that, that was nothing more uh, rewarding to work in the county hospital for 30 years in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. So when you get sick, nobody cares what you look like if you can heal them. And even if you don't speak the language, you know, learn to speak Spanish and all that. And uh, I, I love to say that uh, they, they used to call me the El Jefe Grande. That's the big boss in Spanish. Mm -hmm. So I didn't, I didn't know what, what, what that meant. But um, um, everybody knows when you care and, and the love in your heart, they, they'll know uh, by, uh, by just how, talk, how you talk to them and how you uh, interact with them and wanting to get to know them. And so uh, I've always wanted to know, to know who people really are. And that, that's like who you are, who you are, why you are, where you're going, where you came from. And so that's the most important uh, thing that we can do. And so uh, if I'm sitting on an airplane, uh, you want to say you want to ask somebody what they do, and I just ask them one question: What's your background? Mm -hmm. That means they can talk about anything they want to, mm -hmm. and it's amazing the people you meet. And so it and 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 we all want to be up there like kind of like the peacock, if you will, uh, you know, <laughs> the, mm -hmm. the head of everything. But uh, as I've grown and you know you become more, I guess, prominent or whatever, and you fly first class, you know, you want to uh, be up there all the time, but. You know, that God will always humble us and put us back where he wants us to be. Mm -hmm. And so when I get stuck back in the back, I, I, ultimately I'll end up meeting somebody that was better than riding up there at first. Yes, sir. Every time. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. So, so, so you just have to stay humble and mm -hmm. humility and all that. Now, Dr. Willis is the reason I became a podiatrist. And I was honored to give the Martin Luther King speech in Longview one year. He, mm -hmm. he was over it. And he asked me to come to give the speech. And, uh, and I wrote a nice speech. But I never gave my speech because those people there did, did not know the impact of Dr. Willis. And so I had just read, I was talking about Galatians 6, 1 through 10, uh, I think verse uh, probably about 8 or 9, uh, 7 or 8 down there said, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sow, he'll reap. And so I talked, shared with them what Dr. Willis had sowed so I could reap. All right. And now, as the seed reconnects, he would have never thought that I would be the reason that he got hospital privilege in the hospital I was born in. Mm. That's how the seed reconnected. Because I, I was a president-elect of our state society in Texas, and we went to the legislature and amended the Health Licensing Act. It says MDDODDS, and we had a DPM in 1985. So Ben Clark and I, uh, Craig Washington was a state senator out of um, Houston. And Carlos Truon was out of Corpus Christi. You must have thought I wrote their script. I never talked to them, but I talked to the uh, chief of staff, or you know, assistants and stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, we passed that bill, and uh, Cindy Cryer was a Republican state senator from San Antonio. And I was in leadership in San Antonio in 81 when she was uh, co-chair of the uh, leadership. And I had told her we couldn't, I couldn't fix our bunion at Santa Rosa, Baptist, Metro, Nix, and downtown hospitals. And she said, well, y'all need to come to the legislature and fix it. And so the day we the bill passed, she called me up and said, Larry, I just want you to know your bill passed. Send a bill of 655. Y'all got 29 votes and two absent. She called me up to tell me that. That's significant. Mm -hmm. That's that shows down how things are connected and um, and and, uh, and all of that. And I forgot how I got off on the, in, into that mm -hmm. that part. But our, um, uh, but it's going through service mm -hmm. and helping and, and the people and the connections we uh, meet and uh, and stand focused on, uh, on on serving and making making it better for for mankind. I think that's the key. Yes, sir. And, and Kevin, you Certainly. are epitome of all that. Thank you for Thank you, man. who you are and what you are doing and continue to do. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, what we can uh, continue to do in NMA mm -hmm. and helping more uh, students and and, and etc. Yeah. So uh, I know that uh, they're in good hands uh, as long as you in, in leadership. Uh, and uh, being here in the, in DC, where it all happens, mm -hmm. so so it's all good. I appreciate that. Hey, everybody! Uh, after you see this, be sure you spread the word and send the link uh, to your friends and classmates and family members. Got got to listen uh, to this gentleman's words of wisdom. Like, again, I've been blessed all of my career, even before I got my uh, degree and license, to have known what this man means, not just to me personally, but to our profession. Larry, I'm, I'm telling you, you've been so positioned as a time like this, right? Yes, sir. Uh, like, like, like we said over lunch, there's no such thing as a coincidence. 
everything happens for a reason. reason. From the time you were planting peanuts in Tatum, Texas, to sitting here in this chair, it's all connected. It's, it's yeah, you know, it's, it's all related. So you know, spread the word. Continue to watch the podiatry section uh, of the NMA channel uh, here. And let's continue to take, uh, stay connected. Uh, Dr. Harkless and I have already had discussions about what we need to do to help grow the profession, particularly grow the profession amongst uh, doctors of, of color, getting our HBCUs involved in recruitment of new podiatrists and people in the health professions at large. Uh, we have to be bigger than podiatrists. We have to be bigger than foot doctors. We have to become integrated into not just the clinical, not just, you know, all the good stuff as far as social media and all the, that comes with that. But we need to be integrated into the teaching aspect, into academic medicine, and then and bringing up uh, the next generation uh, of doctors, even if you've does it decided that you no longer uh, want to be in the office setting? That doesn't mean you have to be done uh, helping our communities. Always good to see you, man. Thank you, everybody. Stay with us. Doc's going to, he's not done. He's retired, but he's not done working. He's going to be working with us in the project section in the NMA right. and the NMA at large of moving this uh, organization forward so we can help our people out. Peace. Get at you.